Well, hello YouTube, it's me, Fortmaster, and welcome back to another film theory reaction, and your favorite Disney character is a killer? I mean, maybe? I mean, that, again, that always really depends on who your favorite character is, but I mean, off the top of my head, the only one that I can really think of that has, like, a confirmed body count would possibly be possibly be Mulan because you know she was in the army and there's that scene where she launches the firework into the mountain causes an avalanche and that kills the enemy army I mean I I, I know there are other characters that have like that have like at, least, at the very least suspected uh, like kill counts but none of them spring to mind at the moment wait a second does this video have chapters do theory videos usually have chapters? That's new, I think. Yeah, so we got Mickey, Bambi, and Pooh. Oh my. Who'd make the best villain? Peg Leg Pete. Yeah, I, I could definitely see Peg Leg Pete having a having a kill account, especially given that he's, you know, from like the old black and white era of Disney. And he was, you know, the villain the vast majority of the time. Horace and Clarabelle? How could they have a kill count? Oswald. Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Uh, Mickey Mouse? I mean, he has a long enough history, I suspect there could be some, like, snuck into there. Donald Duck? Okay, okay actually, I, I could very much see Donald Duck having a kill count. And Goofy! Oh, okay, sure. I guess we're just pulling them out of everywhere now. Yeah, so, um... I am very confused. Uh, I definitely- and I definitely want to see where this goes. <laughs> So, yeah, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my game theory reaction. And if you have any suggestions for, you know, future reactions I could do, you can, of course, leave them in the comment section below. Or, you know, go to my Discord server, link also in the description, and, you know, leave them in the designated channel there. But, yeah, with all that out of the way, let's get this thing actually started then, shall we? Okay, 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 they can't find me here. No one can find me here. I'm- Oh my god, you know what? I think I just realized what this video is about. I- Oh god, so does this have something to do, again, with like that Winnie the Pooh, like, horror movie that they made, what was it, last year at this point? Because, like, the earliest version of Mickey Mouse, like, Steamboat Willie went to public domain at the beginning of this year, and my god, did, did were there like a bunch of people just waiting in the wings to release, you know, something horror related with it? And I think I remember hearing that the people who made the Pooh movie were gonna be making like a Bambi movie next as well? Oh god, are these all... Are these all characters that are going to be being released into the public domain in the next few years from Disney and stuff? And they're gonna, you know, obviously somebody's gonna make a like a, a cheap horror movie off of them or something. Uh safe. I'm safe. You're so sure about that, pal? What? No, no. Who? Baby? No, not you two, Mickey, not you. And this is just the beginning, ha huh? Just you wait until my friends show up. No! Yeah, I was right. I Hello, was right. Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, the show that is continuing to ruin childhoods both old and new. So, did you hear about this movie? I uh, well, I mean, you didn't have to ruin Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, those cheapskates did it themselves. Where Mickey Mouse goes on a killing spree? Where the hell did he go? Yeah, this is a very real movie called Mickey's Mousetrap, and as of the time of writing, it's supposed to release in early April. We'll see if that actually happens. So, how the yeah. heck is this <laughs> a thing? How could Disney let this clear ripoff slip through the cracks? And how have they not sued these filmmakers into oblivion for because misusing they their primary mascot? Well, we actually explain exactly how in a video from last year about another of Disney's characters turned movie monster, Winnie the Pooh. So, go check that out if you want the full story. But the long Long and short of it, Steamboat Willie, the cartoon that featured the original appearance of Mickey Mouse, has now entered the public domain here in the United States, so everyone owns Steamboat Willie and all of its characters, with some pretty significant caveats. Again, go watch that older theory where we explain everything in detail. It's I'll summarize them right now, so because I remember them. Basically, it has to. It, it can you can only use depictions 
of Mickey Mouse that are, you know, the same as this, as in like Steamboat Willie. You can't use like later redesigns of him and stuff like that. So of course, you know, Mickey Mouse the character in his new modern recreation is still owned by Disney, but it's just the very oldest design that is in a public domain. Which, actually thinking about it, does Mickey has been really, has been designed a number of times, so I wouldn't hesitate to say that I could possibly see us getting a new redesign for like the default look of Mickey within probably five or 10 years, just so they get like a new, I don't know what you call it, stop gap, gate, I don't know what you'd want to call it. It's something we're going to be seeing a lot more of in the coming decade as more and more of these pillars of pop culture start entering the public domain. And just to be clear, overall, this is a major win for all of us. Art mm -hmm. was never meant to forever be the property of corporate overlords. After a reasonable period, it's supposed to belong to everyone reasonable. so that it can be remixed and reimagined and turned into something new and exciting, exactly like how Disney themselves made their name back when Walt was turning fairy tales into kids cartoons. But for now, this means that anyone, including you right there at home, can take Mickey Mouse and do whatever you want with him. Sure, that could mean using him in your new American classic novel or tasteful painting, but it could also mean using him in your very own low budget horror movie like Mickey's Mousetrap, or a scary video game, or another scary video game, or last week tonight with John Oliver. Yo! Not special. Nothing about you is special. <laughs> Ugh, spooky. Though I'm Ugh. not sure anything could be just how horrifying Mickey Mouse was the first time he appeared in live action. Regardless, this. I'm sorry. What was that? Oh my. Wait a second. Is that like a monkey that they've dressed up? Oh, that poor thing! Time he appeared in live action. Regardless, this is a weird phenomenon. These classic cartoon characters being transformed into these grotesque horror movie monsters and serial killer slashers. Like, I get it. It makes sense, don't get me wrong. The sheer novelty of characters like Mickey being twisted into the stuff of nightmares will get butts in seats. That's why you're seeing so many of these low-budget horror movies starring characters like Mickey, Winnie the Pooh, or Bambi pop up. But today, I do have a question about all all of this. Is Mickey Mouse actually the best choice for this? If we wanted to actually make a good horror film, is he the character from the classic cast of the Mickey and Friends canon that should be taking center stage? When you break down what actually works in scary cinema, which of Walt's creations would actually be the most effective mass murderer on Main Street USA? Who would be the best Disney movie monster? Oh, okay, so that's where they're going with this. Well, um, I mean, at the very least, I am intrigued. Let's see where this goes. Prepare those fast passes, friends. Let's dive into the magic and find out. And speaking of classic, iconic characters, you don't get more classic or iconic than Godzilla and Kong. And I had the opportunity to do an officially licensed collection of apparel with Legendary Entertainment based on their new film, Godzilla Kong, The New Empire. Yeah, you heard that right. I got to help design and create official apparel with the people who actually made the movie. And dude, getting to make things I can actually wear in my body based on some truly legendary cinema icons is just incredible. It was too hard to choose which character we liked more, so in traditional kaiju fashion, we decided to pit the two against each other. We have matching hoodies based on Godzilla and Kong, so you can go choose your favorite and show your allegiance to either Titan. Or if you can't choose between them, you can also have them team up just like they do in the movies. We have this super rad reversible jacket that's faux leather on one side representing the king of the monsters and fleece on the other representing the eighth wonder of the world. So, if you want to show your love for either of these iconic kaiju from the MonsterVerse, go pre-order our officially licensed apparel. Again, that is so freaking awesome. Over on theorywear.com. But now, back to the episode. So, how are we going to be measuring this? Well, after watching a lot of horror films, I've narrowed down what makes a good scary movie villain down to three main pillars. First, what's the potential for their unique design? You can recognize many of the best horror monsters and villains at a glance. The Xenomorph, Samara, even Michael Myers with his Bill Shatner mask. You see these guys? And you yeah. instantly know who they are and what their deal is. So which of these Disney characters can get us that same effect? Secondly, we'll want to look for memorable powers or abilities. What sets these monsters apart from the rest of the pack? For Besides Kruger just holding a knife. In your dreams. Pennywise can weaponize and feed on your fear. Both owe a 
lot of their longevity to those powers. And thirdly, we're going to look at the character's ability to act as a commentary on what society fears. The best horror films have villains that are born of what our Unfriended. culture is Unfriended. Oh god, I forgot that was that a the thing. thing. might be the best example I can think of. Exploiting Cold War era distrust of your neighbor or stranger danger to create a true S-tier level film. If our Disney monster can recapture just a fraction of that dark magic, we are golden or bloody. I'm not sure which is preferable in this situation. On top of that, we'll also be measuring the characters in a fourth category, their importance to Disney. This will act as a gauge of how much of a draw this character will be in today's pop culture. Because yeah. if we're making a public domain horror movie ripoff, we want people to actually see it. Now with these four categories laid out, we'll be going through each of them and rating the characters out of four. Which, I mean, given that one of the chapters we see is uh, was Horrence and Clarabelle. Like, th those two combined, I think I can count, like, the number of times I've seen them in more modern, like, uh, like, Mickey and Disney cartoons and stuff on one hand. And most of those were Clarabelle. Actually, thinking about it, I think the most, well, at the very least, the most recent one I can remember was, I think she appeared in, what was it, The Three Musketeers and she was Goofy's love interest? Yeah, I think that's it. The end will tally up each score and see who wins. Which brings me to who are our contenders? Well, just so we aren't going way overboard here and talking about like 25 <laughs> different characters, we're going to have to be a little judicious about who we talk about. Yeah. Obviously, we have to put Mickey Mouse himself in the ring, as well as Donald Duck and Goofy, who make up Disney's big three. We're also going to bring in Mickey's original nemesis, Pete, as well as Clarabelle Cow and Horace Horsecollar in a single entry. Both of those characters actually actually predate some of the main Mickey cast and have very similar roles and abilities in the early cartoons, thus them being just a single entry. And finally, we're also okay, going that's to why they're Oswald together. the Lucky Rabbit, who you probably know best from the cult classic video game Epic Mickey. Oswald was yeah. Walt Disney's actual first cartoon character before he made Mickey, but whom he lost ownership of due to murky contracts. And fun fact, Disney wanted the rights back so badly that the company traded an actual, real human being, sportscaster Al Michael in exchange for Oswald back in 2006. Is that how they got him back? What? <laughs> Granted, I mean, I don't watch sports, so I knew literally nothing of this. All I know is I was playing Epic Mickey and I found and I saw this rabbit character who I'd never seen before and later learned was Mickey's predecessor. You cannot make this up. Now, you might have noticed some pretty big omissions there, like Minnie Mouse, Daisy Duck, and Pluto. Sadly, they didn't make the cut for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Pluto's pretty much just a dog. Yeah, he's a normal dog. Horror cinema. While Minnie and Daisy are basically just female versions of Mickey and Donald. We didn't want to retread the same ground, and they don't bring a whole lot new to the table. Hey, yeah. Don't blame me. Blame Disney. And as for other more obscure characters, if part of the reason that they're being strip mined for these public domain horror movies is the novelty of seeing a popular cartoon character do murder, I'm not sure we're gonna get the same sort of draw from Mortimer Mouse, the Mad Doctor, or the Phantom Blot. I mean, okay, um, but also, jeez, ha wait, has that Bambi movie actually been released yet? Oh, of course it comes out on Halloween, of course. Never mind, that must be from a trailer or something. And finally, with all of that said, oh, come on, way, yeah, Mortimer has the memes. Come up, on, Disney's OG villain, Pete. Now, modern versions of Pete are supposed to be a cat, but you look at this thing and you tell me it's a cat. Like, maybe it's a Maine Coon? He always looked more like a bear to me, personally, but. Uh, no, well, I mean, like, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell what he is, but I mean, it's very much the sort of deal where, like, if you put Pete next to a bear, he looks very cat-like, granted like a big fat cat, but still. Especially, you know, pointed ears, the, his nose is more like, you know, uh, like a cat. You know, thinking about it, it'd probably be a lot easier to tell what he was if he didn't have like the massive chin and underbite. Is that? Yeah, that's under. That's what it's called. That confusion could make for a fun monster design. Additionally, for a while there, the character was known as Peg Leg Pete, and combined with his original steamboat pilot persona, that could give us a really strong visual identity, like a pirate bear cat. So a solid three out of four for unique design. Other okay, okay. Versions of the character saw Pete take on various professions: a hunter, trapper, an athlete, an old west desperado. You get the idea. He's sort of all over the place. Oh god, yeah, that one old design right there on the left, that looks like a cat. 
Though, I mean, just, <laughs> you gotta love how, like, all three of these are supposed to be the same character in the same, like, era, but, like, they don't look similar at all. <laughs> I mean, apart from him having a peg leg. But even then, two of them don't have peg legs! But, all in all, Pete was very strong, so a horror version of that character should definitely work with that. And Pete's roots as a feline also help him from a speed standpoint. Yeah, despite his bulk, Pete has usually been depicted as shockingly agile, able to keep up with the likes of Mickey. But, that being said, strong thing that moves fast isn't exactly breaking new ground. Pete no, would not basically really. just be a furry Michael Myers, so one out of four when it comes to unique powers. Pete's ability to act as commentary is also a bit shaky, like he's a bad guy who would become a slasher bad guy. I guess we could go with the whole misunderstood monster angle, but at max, that gives him a 2 out of 4 for the commentary. And finally, Pete- Yeah? I mean, I was almost thinking something along the line with like pirates, or like un- like- like- like something to do with like bad business practices since he's like a- like a- like a river pilot. Or something like, yeah, there's not really much you could do with him in that uh, that way. Its importance to Disney is also a bit lacking. I would argue that as Mickey's main rival, he's a bit more significant than, like, Pluto, but not by much. So, two out of four there. Leaving Pete with a total... Oh, it's out of four! I thought we were going out of five. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. ...of eight out of sixteen. Middle of the road, but we can do better. Like... I have a, I, again, I have a very strong feeling that Horace and Clarabelle are going to be a lot lower than that. Maybe with Horace Horse Collar and Clara Bell Cow. Horse. Let me ask you, do you know what's fascinating about these two? Absolutely nothing. Not a gosh darn thing. In fact, As I I'm thought. betting that some of you only just now found out that these characters even exist because of this video. So right up front there, they're both getting a one out of four for importance to Disney. They're yeah. more likely to show up at a bar trivia night than a mainline Disney product at this point. But do you know what's mildly interesting about Horace Horse Collar and Clara Bell Cow and why I wanted to talk about them today? They're two of just very few characters in the Mickey and Friends canon that have been shown to walk both upright and on all fours in the same cartoon. Yeah, Horace and Clarabelle straight up shapeshift. Ever since their early appearances in cartoons like 1928's The Plowboy, Horace and Clarabelle could full on transform from a normal four legged cartoon animal to a humanoid, upright, walking, talking person at will. Their front hooves even morph into gloved hands. Now that's really cool cool in concept. Oh yeah, I guess. Yeah, if you had them as like a shape-shifting, like, oh, something killed like the farmer on this farm and then you only see his regular animals and then as soon as they go turn away, they like, like painfully or almost like the thing transform to like humanoid forms and continue on the prowl to kill something or, or other. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm not one for horror films, but that could, yeah, that could definitely be something and gives both of these characters a real leg up in both potential for unique design and memorable powers. Seriously, imagine some crazy cow or horse-shaped monster that could twist and morph its body, bones cracking and skin tearing as it turns into a humanoid, a la The Thing. So right yeah. there for me, that's a solid three for unique design and a four for memorable powers. Basically, oh, okay, this yeah. one fact put these characters in contention today. And just to put a cap on things, there's also some great potential potential for commentary on how our reliance on these sorts of domesticated beasts of burden is turning the tables for us as humans. That could even fit super well with these two kind of turning into humanoid characters. So for commentary, they're also getting a three out of four. Honestly, a surprisingly strong showing from Horace and Clarabelle with 11 out of 16. E wow, okay, um, major upset there. I had no idea they were gonna, that is like jeez even if their lack of importance to pop culture really hurt them in this scenario. Yeah, in the so box office Oswald especially. The Lucky Rabbit, Disney's original main character. Believe it or not, but there were almost 200 Oswald shorts back in the 20s and 30s, but 200? sadly, he never really took off in the same way later characters like Mickey would. And so... eventually, Oswald got revamped into a, almost a totally different character in comic books in the 50s before vanishing entirely in the 60s. Why? Yeah, so well, that's a, a one, I guess. A guy named Oswald killed the president, and suddenly, 
Oswald was not a very popular name. I ah. don't have a joke here. Sometimes reality is just stranger than fiction. In any case, yeah, Oswald, okay. the rabbit, not the assassin, was basically an economy model Mickey Mouse and a pretty basic cartoon character. And I fear that this would transfer to any horror movie version of him too. It would basically just turn into another spoopy man in a rubber rabbit mask a la Mickey Mouse Trap or Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey. So one out of four in potential for unique design. Yeah. Additionally, this whole aspect of being forgotten to time is a bit of a double-edged sword here for Oswald in our horror scenario. On the one hand, there's a potential for a really good story about a forgotten character coming back and forcing himself to be remembered by going on a murder rampage, especially in this era where companies like Disney have monetized every bit of our collective nostalgia. But yeah. on the other hand, well, even if the Disney corporate machine wanted Oswald back, he disappeared from history for a long time and basically nobody cared. So a solid three out of four for potential for commentary, but a paltry one out of four for his importance to Disney. And yeah, I mean, again, I can almost see, see something like that. I can very much almost imagine like you have the person like who puts on the mask finds like an old reel or something with a bunch of old like Oswald cartoons saved on it, but it's like a cursed like real or something or a cursed videotape or whatever it is and as he's watching it he's slowly like possessed by the angry spirit of oswald angry that he's been that he's been basically forgotten by uh, not only like the uh, wider society, but also the company that helped create him. Well, not helped create him, but created him. As for his unique powers, here's where Oswald really shines because his main power is literally in his name. Oswald, he has luck. the lucky rabbit. There hasn't ever really been a horror movie monster that has weaponized luck. And there's a ton of potential there for something really clever and unique. Like just imagine a monster that could cause some sort of Final Destination-esque Rube Goldberg machine of death just by tweaking the luck of its victims. So Oswald gets a four in this category oh, for a total of okay. nine out of 16. Respectable, okay, more than but Pete, sadly, really? not quite enough to squeak past fellow forgotten Disney characters Horace and Clarabelle. Truly tragic. But <laughs> enough beating around the bush, let's get to the big leagues, starting with Mickey himself. Now, let's oh, yeah. get the obvious out of the way. It's Mickey freaking mouse. He's going to have a four in importance. Of course, of category. course, yeah. And people would want to watch a horror movie starring him. There's a reason so many horror film versions of the character are being rushed out. Mickey is a character that holds a special place in pop culture, which I would say also gives him a serious edge in the character's ability to act as commentary. Because Mickey is so synonymous with Disney, there's a lot you can say about that company and what they represent. Taking well-known IP and manufacturing new content that sells nostalgia more than originality and turn it into a powerful story. And all of that without even touching Mickey's origins as a trickster, which could also become a great story element in and of itself. So yeah, definitely, again, four definitely. Out of four when it comes to commentary. Additionally, I would argue that Mickey also gets a bump in the unique design area simply because the character itself is so recognizable. The sheer novelty of horror Mickey, the family-friendly character turned murderous psychopath, really helps Mickey stand out in unique design where characters like Oswald suffered, earning him a three out of four. However, when it comes to memorable abilities, Mickey struggles a little bit. See, yeah, I mean. Like, what powers can you think of Mickey having? I mean, besides, you know, the, like, bog standard rubber hose powers that every character of the era had, which at that point aren't really powers. Like, in that regards, there's literally nothing, nothing special about him, besides the fact that he's small. He, he was the underdog in many of his classic cartoons, outsmarting opponents like Pete with his trickster instincts instead of overpowering them. That being said, mice are known to be very quick and stealthy, and Mickey himself knows his way around a rifle and has demonstrated handy skills as a swordsman, which could translate pretty well into a prototypical slasher villain, you know, basically exactly what we see in Mickey's mousetrap. Yeah. That being said, the thing that keeps Mickey from getting a one here, his potential in the near future. See, Fantasia was released in 1940, which means that it will also be in the public domain in the foreseeable future, meaning that there's a world where Mickey is getting legit magical powers in these horror movies. And oh you know, by that God. point, I'm sure we're gonna have so many freaking horror movies with this character that it's gonna make Jason and Space look reasonable, so magic- Actually, wait a second. Fantasia was released in 1940? Okay, well, I'm, I guess that, that just kind of screws with my, you know, idea of it because I always saw it either on TV 
or, you know, on, like, videotape at, like, a friend's house or something like that. I never thought of it being, like, that old, really. Hey, Mickey. Yeah, that checks out. And it could be scary, so two out of four for unique powers. Either way, this leaves Mickey in a great position at the head of the pack here with 13 out of 16 points. But is the mouse the head honcho? Next up, the character that might be Mickey's main competition here, Donald Duck. Let's mm. not mince words here. Donald is the only of Disney's characters whose personality would need zero adjusting to star in a slasher movie. The Duck. Yeah, the guy, uh, he is quite literally insane in some instances. Um, anger issues as well. I mean, yeah. I mean, all you have to do is give him a knife and then you're just, you know, slasher villain. Ducks a full blown psycho. <laughs> Prone to violent outbursts, temper tantrums, and fits of blinding rage against everyone from his best friends to random strangers, it's easy to see why this loose cannon wild card was actually more popular than Mickey for much of the 30s and 40s, and why he may be the more effective killing machine. For one thing, did you know that Donald is the only of Mickey's friends with an actual military service record? Yeah. Oh yeah. Real. Well, not only that, but he served both sides. Okay, no, I, I know he did. He wasn't actually a Nazi. That was that one episode he was a dream but yeah he i mean one he's a sailor so you you presume that he'd be in the navy but no he was in the army donald duck was frequently used in old propaganda cartoons and has been recognized as a well-decorated soldier by the real united states military in the real world yeah in real life all in all this does a lot for donald across all of our categories first of all a horror movie villain that used to be a military service member allows us to PTSD. do a lot with social commentary yeah exploring definitely themes of PTSD or how soldiers often struggle to reintegrate with society after their service. There's a really powerful story in there about the lack of empathy and support that our service members are given. So kind of like the first Rambo, but with a duck instead of Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Rambo with a, with, with a duck instead of Stallone. Oh my god. That paints a picture, doesn't it? It would also give our movie monster Donald access to all of the training and equipment that the real US military offers. So this is a duck that can fight and shoot on top of his quick temper. The soldier slash sailor getup also gives Donald a leg up in terms of his unique design. Though mutant birds are no stranger to horror cinema, just look at hatching, thanks killing, the rage, and well, the birds. Combining the birds, it with yeah. the military aesthetic adds the same flair that gave Pete a bit of an edge earlier. And that that's without bringing in the actual physiology of ducks, which could really enhance our horror Donald into something wild. For instance, did you know that ducks can pull all-nighters that put us theorists to shame? Ducks can literally sleep with one eye open, only putting half of their brain to sleep while the other is awake, alert, and on the lookout for predators. Really? Okay, I didn't know that. I always thought, I had heard that there are, are other animals that can do that, but all the ones I had heard of were like, uh, we're like mammals, uh, we're, we're like ocean-bound mammals, you know, not like seals, but like dolphins, orcas, killer whales, you know, that sort of stuff. Like, I didn't know, a, I guess like, if you're a bird, I guess that does make a lot of sense, especially one that like, either, is either like in marshland or in pretty open areas so that you could actually, you know, uh, protect yourself or at the very least get away if something you know, is coming for you. So yeah, I could definitely see that. That means that Donald here could literally watch you 24 seven while getting his own full eight hours of rest. And no matter where you go, ducks can keep an eye on you. Because of the placement of their eyes on the sides yeah. of their head, they have 340 degrees of vision. So no matter how you approach a duck, it's likely they're gonna spot you coming. And you can't even hide from a duck because they have tetrachromacy. Basically, this is like the opposite of being colorblind. Instead of having trouble telling colors apart, ducks can clearly see the difference between colors and shades that humans can't. Meaning that you might think that you're perfectly camouflaged, but Donald can see you always. Oh God, okay, now I, I, this is absolutely terrifying. Granted, I knew some birds have that sort of stuff, but I always thought it was more limited to more like tropical birds, you know, like parrots and stuff like that. Jeez, this is getting absolutely freaky. Wait a second, Goofy is after this. Oh my God, what what absolute hell are they gonna bring on with Goofy? Cause like, I know he, he, well either him or, you know, people of his same species were used in a lot of cartoons. 
So again, great power set here. All in all, this adds up to Donald getting super solid threes across the board, with an additional fourth point in his importance to Disney since he's one of the company's heaviest hitters. That leaves Donald tied with Mickey at 13 out of 16 points. Perhaps not that surprising when you consider that these are probably Disney's oh, top two most popular what characters. What are you going to bring but with Goofy? as they duke it out, we do have one final contestant to talk about. George G. Goof better known as Goofy. See, going into this whole episode, I had a feeling that Goofy was going to be an underdog to take the whole thing, for a number of reasons. Well, Firstly, one, he's an actual like dog. Mickey and Donald, Goofy is one of Disney's big three, automatically giving him a four in his importance. But it's when you start breaking down the other categories that things really get interesting. For instance, what exactly is Goofy again? Like, he looks to be some sort of dog, but not a dog like Pluto is, so he's more of a weird dog human hybrid that well yeah if i remember correctly i forget where i heard this i think it was like on some wiki or something or but like old disney had like two classifications of animals you had normal animals who were you know normal and then you had silly animals which were all the ones that were bipedal you know mickey donald uh goofy eventually so donald and pluto are both dogs but Pluto is a normal dog, while Goofy is a is a is a silly dog. That right there already has a lot of history with the horror genre, and we could werewolf werewolf mythology here. But there's actually a different direction that I would go. See, oh. a strangely recurring motif in early Goofy cartoons was to set him in the American Southwest, like an El Guacho Goofy and Two Gun Goofy. And I figure if someone's gonna make a shameless cash grab public domain horror film exploiting Mr. Goofier, they might as well go the extra mile and misappropriate some culture too. Many of the indigenous Native American peoples across the plains and the Southwest believe the coyote to be a trickster spirit, one who could shapeshift and occasionally look the form of a human being. Coyotes are obviously part of the canine genus, so one taking human form and becoming this sort of dog-man hybrid masquerading like a normal human like Goofy could make for a super compelling design. It could also let us get various different stages of man-dog hybrid throughout the movie, letting creature designers get creative and bringing in some of that body horror we like so much from Horace and Clarabelle. So okay. he's getting a four here in his potential for a unique design. Additionally, the coyote myth actually works surprisingly well with other Goofy cartoons from the 40s. During this period, Goofy starred in Disney's How To series, a string of mockumentaries where Goofy lived in a world full of other Goofies. He was basically just a normal everyman. In a <laughs> horror context, this could really let us lean into a distrust of your neighbor. If, for a great deal of the movie, Goofy just looked like any old normal person, this disguise could lead to some great tension as our protagonists tried to figure out who is the trickster spirit haunting them. Can you trust your neighbor, your partner, your best friend, your dog? Or are they a coyote man trying to trick and murder you? That is a great analog for the real world distrust a lot of people are feeling for their fellow human beings right now. So yeah. again, that's a four for potential commentary. And what's more, this how-to series also demonstrated Goofy's ability to master pretty much any physical athletic feat you can imagine, including gliding, skiing, swimming, fishing, hockey, baseball, gymnastics, golf, Olympic track and field, and even the history of martial arts. On top of taking advantage of this shapeshifter coyote trickster spirit, the Goof is also He's just a, a master monster combatant. when it comes to his physical prowess. So that's a solid three for Goofy's powers and abilities, leaving him with 15 out of 16 points and putting him clearly at the head of the pack. George G. Goof is our winner today and clearly the best pick for a Disney horror movie. For almost a century, we've seen Goofy as this lovable, lanky dude just trying his best, trying to be a good dad. But when you step back and look Max, at it, there yeah. doesn't seem to be any tool he can't use, any skill he can't somehow blunder through, any physical challenge he can't rise to, and any scenario he can't improvise his way out of. As Mickey and friends march into the public domain and will inevitably be picked apart by horror filmmakers, today we've proven that Goofy is the most uncanny. He has the powers, he has the potential for commentary, he has the unique design, and the importance to pop culture. The only thing he really needs to turn him into a horror movie monster is something to set him off. And let's be real, if you're in a horror movie and you've reached it that doesn't point, take that much, does it? Of George G. Goof himself? Well, 
you've done goofed already. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. I swear, or a lot of these things, I mean, it, I, granted, again, I'm not going to be one of those people that actually goes to see these movies. I don't like horror. I'm, I'm very much... You know, I, I'm good with just being a guy on the sidelines watching other people watch it. I I like that barrier of separation. I don't do good with horror. Like, these pow these potential powers. I mean, like... Of course, I had heard, like... Of, of course, I've watched a lot of cartoons and stuff like that. And, like, I had heard of, like, Horace and Clarabelle. But I didn't know that they were depicted as both being bipedal and, like, having a feral body plan. And then Goof, yeah, with like the shape-shifting coyote thing going on. I mean, even then, if you wanted to make a movie with him, you could very much have it where, like, he's not, like, malicious to start with. I mean, it's been shown uh, many times that Goofy, for all of his, well, goofiness, is a family man. He loves his son. He loves his family. So, I mean, what if you did something like that where, like, it, like, during the course of the movie, he's he has his son, and they're just pretending to be normal humans, just because it's easier than living out in the wild, you know? But then, you know, something goes wrong, like his son gets hurt, maybe gets hit by a car or something, and the person who was responsible, you know, gets it was a drunk driver, but because of connections, they, you know, get, get off scot-free or something like that, because, you know, money equals power. And then that's when they snap. And that's when they start going after them and everybody that's associated with them that helped them get away with the murder of his son. Oh yeah, I could definitely see that. That would be cool. Oh, so I guess with all that out of the way, of course, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my game theory reaction. And with all that out of the way, I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.